Hi there. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bruce Suttmeyer. I'm a faculty member in World Languages, and I serve as dean of the college. Um, and I'm honored to be included uh, in this very happy occasion uh, tonight where we uh, install Jay Odenbaugh as the James F. Miller Professor of the Humanities. Um, let me start before I um, extol all of uh, Jay's many accomplishments, uh, talk a, a little bit about uh, James Miller, whose name lives on in this professorship. Um, it was established in 1999, and I'm very happy to see exactly, we're all pointing, uh, that Nick Smith the, uh, is here, um, the inaugural, and um, many years, the only one who was the James F. Miller Professor of the Humanities. Um, James F. Miller was a, a really a great friend of the institution, a, a, a benefactor of the college, um, a trustee, uh, a member of the board of, the, of trustees, and a life trustee, um, a graduate of Lincoln High School at age 16, a voracious reader of Charles Dickens, he would like to say, a student at the University of Washington who had to drop out of college when he ran out of money and was never able to finish. A stockbroker and investor who in 50 years of work rose to the top of one of the most prestigious uh, investment banks at Wall Street. Um, and a philanthropist and a real lover of, of Lewis and Clark who liked to say his early dreams were about education and about teaching. And uh, he noted, if I'd had the money when I was young, I'd have been an English professor. Uh, his philanthropy, certainly beyond the college, um, included stints on the boards of the New York uh, Metropolitan Opera, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, closer to home, he supported the Oregon Community Foundation, uh, the Art Museum, OHSU, the Symphony, the Ballet, um, and the list went on and on. At Lewis and Clark, he endowed two scholarship funds for students. He founded an annual grant fund for students as well. He gave generously to create not only this position, but also the Odell professor, um, professorship, and of course the building that bears his name, the, the Miller Building, um, as well as uh, Howard Hall, uh, which he did a lot to help um, build the funding for that. Uh, he was recognized with an honorary degree in 1973, and uh, was awarded the uh, Aubrey R. Watsik Award in 1999. Um, he passed away in 2004, but certainly his generosity and his work um, lives on um, in it, the buildings and in the people um, here at the college. So thank you to Jimmy Miller and all the work he did to make this place the place that it is. Um, let me turn to the faculty member who we're honoring this evening with the Miller Professorship. My colleague Jay Odenbaugh came to the college in 2003, having completed his T PhD at the University of Calgary. Um, and I must say, looking up some of this information today online, when you do it through our Workday um, uh, information platform, uh, the picture, I assume, is from 2003 when Jay arrived, um, looking very clean-shaven and looking very baby-faced uh, in that photo. Um, and uh, I remember that. Uh, I was here since 2001, and um, I remember Jay well when he arrived. Um, among the many things I admire about Jay is really the breadth of his scholarly interests. He studies the philosophy of science, the philosophy of the, of the environment, ethics, philosophy of mind. And I also really appreciate and admire his approach to his discipline, which in the tradition of American pra pragmatism, which is what he says is deeply practical, an aid to help us solve the problematic situations we face, he has written, quoting John Dewey. Jay is a prolific scholar, two books, 
about 50 journal articles, his list of scholarly presentations, I just stopped counting. I didn't have time this afternoon to go, but it looked like it was well over 100. Um, he teaches classes ranging from advanced logic and global climate change to metaphysics and philosophy of art and beauty. He also recently taught to the college's uh, ENVS 160, the Introduction to Environmental Studies. He serves on editorial boards for several journals, is the subject editor for the philosophy of biology for the influential Stanford, um, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. He was chair of the philosophy department for many, many years. Uh, and was the recipient of the Lori Loki Faculty Excellence Award in 2018. So let me end with a quote from the man himself, uh, which really crystallizes so much of what I ab admire about his pro approach to both scholarship, his discipline, and his teaching. He writes, beliefs and values have effects, some beneficial and some not. It thus is of profound importance to be responsible for one's views of the world. And my teaching is first and foremost an attempt to bring students to understand and respect that responsibility. On this occasion where the college formally recognizes his inst installation as Miller Professor of the Humanities, I'd like to express my and the institution's gratitude respect and admiration for all, all that he brings to the college, both through his scholarship, his teaching, and his leadership and service on campus. Please join me in welcoming to the lectern the James F. Miller Professor of the Humanities, Jay Odenbaugh. Good in the tie. I like the orange. You like the Lewis and Clark? That's very nice. <laughs> well, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Uh, thank you for, for being here today. Um, let me get out of this here. Let's see if this works. Aha, good. Um, well, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to say a few thanks to um, just a few people who are here. Um, first, uh, President uh, Holmes Sullivan and Bruce uh, for this tremendous honor. Um, it's, I feel sort of uh, just really appreciative of the institution, and uh, so thank you. Um, I want to say thanks to my department, uh, both past, present, uh, future. We're hiring, so it'll be someone new. Um, uh, in particular, Becco Copenhaver, uh, John Fritzman, jo Joel Martinez, <clears throat> and also Nick Smith, and also Bill Rotschafer. Uh, when I was hired, Nick was chair. Uh, he called me and said, Lewis and Clark wants to offer you a job, and I said, I'll take it. And he said, uh, maybe you should negotiate first. And I said, oh, yeah, right. Um, and also, I want to thank my family, um, Stacy Everett and Linda. Uh, it's, you know, you make it all worthwhile, so thank you. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about personal background. So I went to a liberal arts college as well. Uh, I went to a place in uh, Nashville, Tennessee called Belmont College. Um, I studied philosophy and biology and loved both, um, but decided to go with philosophy. Uh, if you had seen me in 1990, what you would have seen is someone who looks not baby-faced, but a bit like that. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, being a philosopher, I love to hang out in the department and have conversations with my fellow students and argue philosophy uh, as much as we could possibly take with the professors as well. Yeah. One day, though, um, I was sitting in the lounge and I looked at the bookshelf and I pulled off uh, the shelf what was strange to me, which was a catalog for a college that I was not at. That catalog was this, Lewis and Clark. So I pulled it and I looked at it and I thought to myself, you know, well, I'm curious, what philosophy classes do they 
offer there, right? So I looked, I don't know if you can see that very well, history and philosophy of mathematics. Notice there's two people teaching it, one a mathematician and also a philosopher. I thought that's cool. There's another class, um, the biological and psychological foundations of values, right? I'm looking at all these classes, and I'm thinking like, why didn't I go there, <laughs> right? And it kept on happening, philosophical psychology. Science and religion, a comparison of ways of knowing, right? Uh, the brain connection, linking genes and behavior. It's kind of remarkable that the Northern Spotted Owl is that by protecting it under the Endangered Species Act, we thereby get to protect the habitat it lives in, and that's old growth temperate rainforest. Um, in terms of that, that land, it could be used for any number of purposes, right? Logging in particular. Now, there's another character in this story, and that's the barred owl. And the barred owl um, is an invasive species, as best we can tell. Um, and it basically is uh, competitively excluding the northern spotted owl, right? Um, it just turns out that the barred owl is a superior owl uh, in a certain, a certain way. So, and I'll talk more about that. Some background. So, you know, it it's, makes sense that I would be teaching in Portland, Oregon, right? Because much of this is setting, this setup is, kind of happening during the 80s and the 90s when the timber wars were happening, right? And so this story kind of drifts through that. So the, the northern spotted owl basically um, had its habitat reduced to less than 10% um, through activities like logging, wildfire, forest clearing, et cetera. Um, and the, the, because it lives only on old growth, um, that meant that the northern spotted owl was essentially doomed unless we did something, okay? If you look at that, map back there, what you can do is see the distribution of the spotted owl species as a whole, and then the subspecies. So the light green is the northern spotted owl. So it's in Washington, it's, it's up in BC, Washington, Oregon, and then sort of Northern California. The orange is the uh, California spotted owl. Uh, and the, the bright yellow is the Mexican spotted owl, right? Though the northern spotted owl is listed as threatened, um, the species as a whole is not. And that's because of the Mexican spotted owl. There's so many of them, right, that well, there's not a lot of them, but there's enough. They're not threatened or endangered. So since the 1990s, populations of northern spotted owl have declined by about 70%. Okay, so um, we're protecting old growth, but it doesn't seem to be having the effect we want. And that's because of the barred owl. So the barred owl basically um, came west uh, about 80 years ago. Um, it, start, it sort of um, kind of came from the eastern forest of, of North America or the United States and sort of drifted um, west and essentially uh, made its way through Canada to British Columbia, then south to Washington and eventually Oregon in the 1970s. Um, we, the best evidence we have is that that range expansion was human caused. Um, essentially, when Europeans came to North America, they displaced and killed Native Americans, right? And in virtue of doing that, the, the Great Plains reforested because they had burned that area. Uh, and so those forests created land bridges for those owls to hop along and come out west. Um, and so, you know, it looks like we created this problem in, in at least two ways. One, we drove uh, northern spotted owls out of their habitat by felling big old trees, and also we started pushing this owl um, west. So more sort of, you know, kind of demographic information about these two owls. So they compete. They compete for resources. Um, the northern spotted owl only lives in old growth, but the barred owl can live in old and young forest. So it's got a leg up on the northern spotted owl. Um, the, the, the northern spotted owl is a sort of interesting animal in that it feeds on a very few things like voles, flying squirrels, some bats, et cetera. It has a limited diet. Um, one of the cool things about the northern spotted owl is that uh, we know so much about it because it's not afraid of humans. So if you make its call, it will fly to you, right? And it still remains the reason why we, we know so much. Um, so the, the barred owl can live in places that the northern spotted owl can't. Uh, it can eat every, <clears throat> everything the northern spotted owl can, plus. So um, barred owls are pretty tough. They can even eat other owls, uh, which is kind of scary. Um, incidentally, can you tell which one's which? Which one's A? Spotted owl, because it has spots, right? The barred owl's the one to its, that it looks pretty nefarious. So basic ecological theory tells us that if two species overlap in their niches too much, um, one of them has to go. 
both could go too. So everything we know is that the, um, the uh, spotted owl will go extinct because of the barred owl and then the previous things we've done. Um, and it turns out when you look at the decline of northern spotted owls, they're most profoundly declining in places where barred owls are. So there's lots of circumstantial evidence that tells us the barred owl is the problem, right? But we don't know that for a certainty, or we didn't, until some um, folks got together and decided to run an experiment. It's a grim experiment. So scientists with various federal agencies, the you know, Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service, et cetera, decided to remove um, some owls in very particular places, um, in four places, one in Washington, Clay Ellum, that will come up again, uh, two in, in Oregon and one on tribal grounds in California. So what they did was they removed barred owls and they had a control population and see what happens as a result, right? Um, the way they removed them, cover your ears, Everett, um, is by a 12 gauge shotgun, right? Um, they had to shoot them. And so um, as of when the experiment concluded, August 31st, 2020, U.S. Fish and Wildlife had killed over 3,000, right? But they definitively determined, as best you can in science, that the problem is the barred owl. So now the question is, what do we do? So you probably think to yourself, like, did we have to shoot them, right? Is there some alternative? And it turns out there isn't. Um, so one of the protocols they thought about using was to remove them by, say, capturing them, so luring them with a call, netting them, and then, you know, basically transporting them somewhere. The problem was Fish and Wildlife communicated with, you know, uh, zoos and aviaries all over the country. No one would take them. The reason why they wouldn't take them is because there's three million of them in the country. They're not an unusual owl. They're a very common owl, right? So basically the lethal strategy was the only thing they could do to run the experiment and was the only thing that worked, right? And so now the question is, what do we do, right? The removal experiment was successful. We determined the barred owl is the cause, uh, at least in part, but the major cause. Um, and it's <clears throat> basically, um, ecological theory tells us that the northern spotted owl is gonna go extinct unless we remove the barred owl, right? But to remove the bar barred owl means we have to kill enormous numbers of barred owl. Right, that's the, the conundrum. And people in you know, various agencies are debating this. What should we do, right? So being a philosopher, I naturally want to weigh in and tell them what to do. No, I don't want to do that, but. From a philosophical point of view, this is where I kind of click in, right? I've been giving a bunch of basic biology and ecology. Um, so first, you might think about what we should do is sort of generated by concerns for animal welfare, right? So these two birds are sister taxa. They're both in the same genus, okay? Um, actually, sometimes they interbreed, and um, that's naturally called the sparred owl, right? Um, that means that being so similar, if one of them can suffer, then the other can too, right? They're both sentient. And so basic animal ethics would tell us that they both deserve equal moral consideration. Many of us think if something can suffer, it deserves our you know, moral consideration. So now what I'm gonna do is run through some arguments for why we might think we should kill the barred owl to save the northern spotted owl. And I'm gonna conclude that none of them are very good, okay? So another component of animal ethics is that when harms are similar and unavoidable, when you can't help but harm them, and the, the, the creatures you're talking about are very similar to one another, the thought is you should harm the few rather than the many, okay? Well, they're similar, right? And we, we've, the harms are unavoidable, so the thought is we should kill the barred owl to save the northern spotted owl. But there's a problem with this argument. So the International Union for the Conservation of, of Nature estimates there's about 15,000 spotted owls um, in the United States. Um, or the spotted owls. And the, in terms of northern spotted owls, there's about 8,000, okay? We've already killed 3,000 barred owls to save those eight. We are very quickly gonna surpass that number. Right? They're not stopping. We can't build a fence, right? There's no wall for the barred owl. So um, the question is, if we're gonna save the, kill the few to save the many, the many are the ones that are gonna be killed, right? And so it seems like a, uh, a basic flaw in the sort of argument. A different sort of um, ethical argument you might run is that we have an obligation to protect endangered species, right? Many of us believe that. Um, and so you think, well, look, the, the northern spotted owl is threatened or endangered, and thus we should protect it. And protecting it means we should kill the, the, the barred owl. But the problem is, is that the northern spotted owl is a subspecies. It's not the same thing as a species. 
the species has not been declared threatened or endangered. And so um, this principle, as true as it might be, doesn't really capture what's going on here. A third set of considerations, and the ones that I find most, um, I guess, engaging, um, is thinking about these issues from an ecosystem level, right? So one of the things that I mentioned was that because the, the Northern Spotted Owl is listed under the Endangered Species Act, we thereby protect this endangered biome of old growth forest, right? Um, there are so many interesting and unique um, animals, plants, and so on that live in these forests. Um, you know, I have a long list of just the raptors, right? Um, it's remarkable. So by protecting old growth, you say we, we protect all of this biodiversity. The only way we're gonna protect this is by essentially through the means of the Northern Spotted Owl. The other thing that's super important about old growth is it sequesters enormous sums of carbon. So if you, clear, if you care about climate change, you wanna mitigate it, you wanna reduce its effects over time, um, one of the things you wanna do is keep around these old forests. Right? So here's the, here's the argument that I found most persuasive of all that we've been considering. I still think it's not a, a terribly good one, but. So here's the thought. We should protect old growth temperate rainforests. Okay, I agree with that. If we're to protect it, we have to protect the northern spotted owl because that's the legal mechanism by which we're gonna save it, right? And so we justify protecting um, old growth through saving the northern spotted owl uh, and killing the barred owl as a result. Right. So this raises a couple of questions for me. Um, first, can we protect old growth temperate rainforest without killing the barred owl, okay? If we could do that, we could do the one without the other. We wouldn't have to kill, you know, the barred owl um, at all, hopefully. That is, could we create legislation to do this directly and not link it to the fate of the northern spotted owl? Well, evidence is we could, and we, ha and we can because we did. So if you start thinking about the laws, the environmental laws that are sort of historically found in the United States, they're remarkable. Um, you know, we did it, we passed the Endangered Species Act and uh, National Forest Management Act, clean air, clean water, you go down the list. And then all, all those laws were passed under a Republican president, namely Nixon, right? So um, this is something we could do. So we don't actually have to kill the barred owl to achieve this sort of legislation. Now, you think to yourself, if you pay attention, you watch a little CNN, read the news, um, Congress seems sort of dysfunctional. Um, and so the idea of passing such a piece of legislation seems really unlikely. But now my worry is this, the justification for killing Bardow rests on our moral failings. It's the fact that we don't have the courage and fortitude to do what we need to do that we're killing these innocent animals, right? And so, um, this was the most persuasive argument I could find for killing the barred owl to save the northern spotted owl, and I think it fails. And so um, this was where I was left about uh, two years ago, a year ago. Um, so I started scrambling. I started thinking, what other things could we, could we do? So if we sever protecting these important ecosystems from the fate of the nor not northern spotted owl, um, is there some other bird or animal that we could sort of use under the ESA? Um, this is one of my favorite birds. I probably like it more than the northern spotted, I'll be honest. Um, this is the marbled murrelet. Um, it lives in old growth, puts its nest in old growth trees, and then it forages in, 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 in the Pacific, right? It's a really lovely bird. Um, it is currently listed. The problem is its distribution is along the coast, right? It's not, further, it's not far enough inland to protect all the old growth, growth we want to. So that's not gonna work. However, there is some good news. And I think this good news strengthens my argument um, of severing the northern spotted owl and, and old growth protection. So Biden, President Biden in 2022 uh, issued an executive order. That executive order um, was called Strengthening the Nations, Communities, and Local, Local Economies. What he asked the federal agencies to do was to measure how much mature an old growth forest was left. Just get an inventory of it. And once he got the inventory of it, and that has been given to us, we know what that is now, we have more than uh, 50,000 square miles of old growth and um, more than 125,000, uh, missed a uh, typo there, 125,000 square miles of mature forest, okay? So what Biden is planning, he's actually soliciting comments as we speak um, on the idea of um, creating uh, an executive order to protect old growth and mature forest. 
right? So this suggests that there's a way forward that doesn't link all of this to the fate of this little tiny owl, okay? Uh, so what we would do is adapt uh, current policies to protect, conserve, and manage national forests and grasslands for climate resilience. Climate resilience is the crucial phrase here. The reason why Biden wants to protect old growth is because it sequesters so much carbon, and they have very important aims to deal with climate change. So this is a, a crucial part of his, his climate agenda, plus a bunch of other things too. So that's good news. Well, bad news. <laughs> so I got an email from a wildlife biologist uh, up in Clay Ellum, and he wrote to me. Um, he had read my paper miraculously. Um, so I'll read you a little bit of what they said. Hi, Jay. Writing to tell you that I enjoyed reading your recent paper, and I've shared it around. So I wrote a paper called Owl versus Owl, naturally. Um, I think the general subject could be further explored. What do we value as a society when the policy, the Endangered Species Act, and plan, the Northwest Forest Plan, set in place to preserve a functionally extinct species, the northern spotted owl, is interacting with fire suppression and climate change? To put an entire ecosystem, seasonally dry forest, on which many species depend at risk. We wrote back and forth, and the basic tenor of our conversation was, is like, you're worrying about the wrong thing. The northern spotted owl is basically gone, right? It's living on the edge, and we, we, we are required under the Endangered Species Act to protect it. Um, the, the, you know, the Endangered Species Act has no provision that says you did enough, right? You have to continue as a matter of legislation. That's the commitment. Um, but the truth is, what he was expressing was a worry that wildfire and climate change are transforming our forests. And if you want to conserve old growth, we have to frame up we have to look at a different scale. We have to start thinking about ecosystem level processes. And this just sort of furthered me in the direction I was going, right? It's, it's sort of delinking species protection from protecting landscapes. So basically, when you start looking at the details, um, I mean, we all know this, we live, we live in the West, um, you know, basically climate change through the mechanism of wildfire um, is, um, changing landscapes. It's, decline, it's decreasing survival rates in the habitat of the northern spotted owl, but more generally, um, just to give you a few statistics, um, large fire, fire frequency increased four times during 1987 to 2003, and if you compare these two periods, 1973 to 1982 to 2003 to 2012, those decades, the average fire season length increased by 84 days. So what I'm suggesting is we shouldn't give up on saving species that are endangered and threatened, but we need to think about the larger picture. And the larger picture includes ecosystems, landscapes, um, et cetera. So now what I want to do is talk a little bit more about what ecosystem con conservation might be. Um, and this is where the philosopher of science comes out. I was being an environmental ethicist. Now I'm going to talk about sort of philosophy of ecology. So one question is sort of just what is an ecosystem, right? And in some of my writing, I've defended a certain view, what I call interactionism. So basically the idea, an ecosystem is a, a group of abiotic and biotic things that interact, um, usually through things like um, nutrient cycling and energy flow. And the strengths of their interaction are greater on average than the things outside. And the easiest example of this you can think of as a watershed. Right? A watershed has sort of geomorphological boundaries where water drains through it, and these processes structure these entities in, a, in an important way. Um, so that's just sort of how I'm thinking about an ecosystem, but we're also interested in kinds of ecosystems, not just the particular ones, you know, Tryon Creek, but um, you know, types like old growth. And in ecology, there's a long-standing debate on how do you capture what is a biome, right? That's what types of ecosystems are. You can do it um, indexically. So you could say you have a, a dug fir old growth ecosystem. You index it to a particular plant or animal. You can also do it in the, the way that Robert Whitaker, famous community, community ecologist, did it, which is that you think about um, ecosystem types by looking at precipitation and temperature, possibly with some other things. So if you look carefully at that old, uh, beautiful picture, you can find temperate rainforests where we live, right? We are sort of, uh, we have a certain kind of, of rainfall and temperature pattern. But then this raises a different kind of question, like once we open the door to conserving ecosystems as opposed to just species, um, what should we target? Right? And so there are a variety of candidates. Um, one would be you know, particular ecosystems, right? Um, you know, try and creek, insofar as it's endangered. That'd be analogous to thinking about species. 
Another thing you might want to do is protect biomes and conserve them. That is types of ecosystems. Okay? So you think, we want to protect old growth wherever it's found. And the third thing, and this is becoming increasingly more pressing, is what we want to do is conserve um, ecological function. Right? Um, there are things that these forest, marine ecosystems, et cetera, do for us that we can't do for ourselves. And so the thought is, is maybe we should zero in on those. Now I should note, those targets are all distinct. They don't completely overlap. So if you choose one, you may not get the other. Um, let me say just a little bit more about functions. Um, in the philosophy of biology, this is a, always a raging debate. You wouldn't know it from philosophers, but um, uh, we disagree extensively about these things. When I say that old growth rainforest has a certain function, that should strike you as sort of odd. It has a purpose, right? Um, so I want to give you two stories. I have a preferred one about how to understand what a function is in the context of biology and ecology. The most popular view links functions to evolution, right? So it says the function of some trait, it could be of an organism, a species, an ecosystem supposedly, is, um, is that it's for whichever or whatever it evolved by natural selection to do in the recent past, right? So our hearts have the function of circulating blood because they were selected for in the past to do that job, right? Um, this is a super awesome theory. Um, the problem is it doesn't readily apply to ecosystems. And the reason being is that ecosystems are composed of abiotic, non-living, and living things. Only the living things can reproduce and evolve. And that means that ecosystems don't evolve and so that story won't apply. So my preferred story is a causal role uh, view. And it basically is pretty simple. Um, it says a part of a system has a function to do something when it contributes to the system's general capacity to do that thing. So uh, this picture is sort of help you think about this. So old growth forest um, sequesters carbon, right? And that uh, prevents warming and all the other effects to some degree. But what old growth forests do contributes to the larger carbon cycle and sequestration of carbon, right? And so that function is what this small part uh, does with respect to the whole. So this is sketching just some of the things I've been thinking about over the years and how they're kind of linked together. My hope is that this will be a next book, book project to kind of work through these issues using the Pacific Northwest as an example, but try to generalize. The generalizing is the hard part. Um, because what I want to say about the Pacific Northwest doesn't necessarily hold across all, you know, socio-ecological systems. But the framework I'm starting to develop has a couple of ingredients, and I thought I'd share them with you just, you know, so you get a feel for what I'm up to. Um, one question I want to know is, who's the actor, right? Who's the one doing the conservation? A second is, what kinds of interventions are we talking about? Are they short-term? Are they long-term? Um, are they active or passive? Um, you know, what's the threat we're facing? I've been talking about invasives and climate change and wildfire, but different contexts will pull on different things. Um, you know, what's the unit of conservation? I've argued we've got to pay special attention to ecosystems, but we still want to pay attention to species as well. What are the reasons for conserving any particular thing? That's crucial from a philosopher's point of view. So do they have intrinsic value? Do they have instrumental value? What about aesthetic value? And then, you know, come in questions about can we actually feasibly do it? Can we price it? Can we you know, estimate costs and benefits? You know, more economic questions. So, conclusion. Um, I don't want to say what I've said today applies elsewhere. So Stacy Everett and I had the good fortune of going to New Zealand. That's Everett when he was one, a little over one. Um, that black arrow shows, is pointing to something remarkable. That's a tuatara. Um, it is um, a reptile, looks like a lizard, but it's not. It is weird, it grows a third eye and then reabsorbs it. It is a mem it's a species in an order that there are no current living species now, right? It, lived, it was contemporaneous with dinosaurs. In New Zealand context, I think it makes perfectly good sense to kill invasives. And it's because of the remarkable endemic biodiversity there. But that is a totally different context, right? And we have to reason about it um, in its particulars. So given climate change and wildfire especially, um, what I want to do is we have to focus on species, but also, we have to focus on ecosystems and their functions. And I'm beginning to gesture at a framework for doing this. And I hope to do it more in the near future. Thank you. So we are at the question and answer portion of the evening. So if anyone has any questions uh, for
for Jay. Please raise your hand, and I will bring you the microphone. All right, start with the easy one. Oh, sure. Oh, so, the, so the black arrow is at the right corner of that opening in the, in the gate, and then the Tuatara is well hidden, but he's there. Oh, well. <laughs> Can you see you? Hey, Ryan. I, I think I understand your reasons for wanting to decouple uh, ecosystem uh, protection from species protection, and that makes a lot of sense to me. But given that the current um, mechanism we have, um, and, and given the current political situation looks like it's not clear that we'll have another mechanism for protecting yeah. uh, ecosystems other than by protecting species. I'm surprised about your conclusion about not killing the barred owls in favor of the spotted owls. And I'm particularly surprised because you're a pragmatist, right? How can, you're not, a, that's not a pragmatic argument. Is that, is that a pragmatic argument? Can you explain to me the relationship between pragmatism yeah. and that particular argument. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the, so one clear thing I want to say is I'm not, against, I'm not for getting rid of the ESA, right? Um, it's an important piece of legislation. It's one of the very few powerful ones we have, so I, we should keep it. And the letter of the law says we should protect species that are endangered and, and threatened. And so I, I think we should continue to protect the northern spotted owl, right? Um, but like I say, you know, linking the spotted owl um, or linking old growth to it creates this really precarious thing. So part of the pragmatism in me is also to make the case when other people won't. Right? Because they're going to people go like, ah, look at Congress. Like, it's, you know, what are they doing? And they're not going to do anything like this. And my point is to sort of to see Biden, President Biden, is doing something of value by recognizing this really important way of dealing with climate change. Um, I think old growth forests are important beyond just that, but that's, that's a good reason. Um, so um, I think my job as a philosopher is to press the case for something that seems impossible, right? And only then can someone see it as possible. And what Biden's doing, of course, is very fragile. If he does an executive order, um, that could be reversed by a different president, you know? And so all of these contingencies matter. But I think part of my role is to, art, and this is being a, a gadfly, is to press for things that people don't want to think are possible. Hi. Um, thanks for this talk. It was really, really fun. I have a question about one of the arguments that you made uh, early on in the ethics portion. Sure. And you said um, it looks uh, problematic or sketchy or something if the reason why we think we can kill the barred owls is that our own moral failure makes it necessary, right? Yeah. Um, and I kind of get why that's sketchy, right? It's like, we're so, <laughs> we're so bad that we have to now do this other bad thing in order to yeah. be less bad. Um, and that seems like it shouldn't be a legitimate kind of thing. But then I think, isn't that really common? And is that really such a, a bad argument? Is, don't, don't we accept something like that in many, many other cases? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, you know, when I, when I worked through these arguments, I went back and forth and I've taught these to, innumerable students and you know and as a teacher I wouldn't lay my hand my, my cards on the table but um, I would often go back and forth um, and it's the political realities problem that would push me in the other direction but here's the, here's the thing for me um, I eventually just had to come clean with what my moral convictions were and I and I just think killing an animal because we are failing at our job as humans is an insufficient reason um, I mean, there are other reasons why you might think killing the barred owl is the right one, but the fact that we can't get our act together seems like a pretty bad one. Um, so, you know, um, but if you press me really hard after a glass of wine or a beer, you know, maybe I'd move towards you a little bit more. But um, I, I just think that in these contexts, these kinds of arguments need to be had publicly out in the open. Um, I also think these are democratic decisions. I mean, these are people for us to make, um, you know. So uh, it's been important for me to make the case of, you know, my convictions and then, you know, go from there. Other questions? Oh. Nice jacket. 
We did not, we didn't plan that. But if no, I can ask Jay this in the department, so if someone else has a question. Um, it's related to, it's kind of the pragmatism. And so you offer a framework, and that framework could be looked at as kind of a way to do environmental ethics or applied ethics. And when I was following your story, your, the logic, um, whether we're talking about species or if we shift and talk about ecosystems, it's really hard for me to think how we're not ultimately just going to face something that's a moral tragedy. And in, in philosophy, for those who don't know, there is discussion about different types of moral tragedies. There are ones that are so bad that they're just so bad, it's like you have to do something really horrible. And then there are ones that are sort of less bad. I mean, so you had the problem of, you had dirty hand, a picture of dirty hands, and this is also kind of known as the problem of dirty hands. So the framework kind of makes it look like you're offering a way to think through this, mm -hmm. and it seems sort of optimistic. Like there's this kind of rational philosopher telling us I'm offering a framework, and I'm kind of thinking you're thinking of yourself, you know, like kind of like Dewey, and ultimately this would be done in some, but that's, I'm having a hard time fitting that slide with the slide where I look at the ecosystems and think, look, whatever choice I make about how to think about the, uh, an ecosystem, like I'm making a decision about how to, where to, what the target is, there's going to be a moral tragedy. And so yeah. um, I'm not saying there's like a deep tension, but how do you deal with that tension? How do we deal with that tension? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, so I don't mean the framework to be uh, optimistic or pessimistic. It's more of a way of structuring conversations, right? So as a, as a kind of pragmatist, I'm a big fan of democracy, right? And so the idea is that this, this would facilitate our thinking about what matters and how to reason about it, right? If you ask me what my own convictions are, right? I mean, one of the peculiar things about me, um, I have to say this, I got in public, um, is that when Nick hired me, right, I was a utilitarian, right? Um, and I'm not anymore. <laughs> um, and I do think there are things like there's a difference between doing something and allowing it to happen, right? I think we're on the hook for certain things, right? Um, and other things that happen just sort of as it were naturally aren't on the hook for. So I guess, um, I don't know if that even kind of gets, uh, moral tragedy is going to happen, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be implicated in it. Right. That's I think as a moral agent who's reasonable and so on. That's not what I want to do. You know. Uh, now, in a genuine moral tragedy, everything's bad. You know. And maybe there's something that's better or worse. But I don't know. I just don't want. I, I think if you don't represent your deep convictions, even if you, even if in the end you lose. I mean, let me give you a different example. Um, we all hopefully will vote in the near term, right? Um, and I'm gonna vote regardless of what the outcome is because it's an expression of, of you know, my character and my care about the republic that we live in. Um, and even if you told me you know, well in advance is pointless, I'd still do it. Um, this is where I think that kind of consequentialist reasoning um, doesn't quite capture my moral, um, I don't wanna use the word intuition of course, but I'll, I'll give that one to you, um, you know, in the sense of um, my convictions, yeah. Hi. Hey, Jack. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, that the regrowth in the Great Plains of forests was by virtue of manifest destiny and co European powers pushing and eliminating Native Americans who traditionally burned that area. Yeah. Um, what do you say about our moral obligation to reburn those forests in the same manner that they did? And, well, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a, one, that email from the wildlife biologist, he mentioned a couple of things that are super important. Um, one of which was um, the role of climate change and wildfire and restructuring our forests, but fire suppression is an equally important component. And so, um, I, you know, thinking about Native American indigenous peoples, um, they cultivated a rich ecological knowledge of how to use um, control burns to do any number of things. And I think um, if you look at the forest outside us here through the windows, um, I sometimes will say that those are, um, you think they're healthy, but they're not. 
right? They're wildly overgrown. There's so much litter. They're tinderbox. And if you look at pictures from uh, Oregon, some of our forests around Mount Hood and other places in the 1930s before we started suppressing fire, they look radically different. They look much more patchy and mosaic-like. And that's sort of the, the, the natural fire regime that existed. So I'm a big fan of controlled burns. I don't want to necessarily be near one, but, you know, um, I think they're a vital contribution to what we're up to. Follow-up? Um, in an alternate history of where Native Americans don't cross the land bridge and come into America, do you think the northern spotted owl would not have existed without the intervention of humans? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if the barred owl hadn't come here, uh, there might be some other, you know, death by a thousand cuts kind of thing, but um, my sense is, is that it was, its numbers were being stabilized because we were no longer uh, logging old growth forest. I mean, it's a really remarkable history if you go back, you know, people, um, logging communities, you know, um, would have like, they create like soup cans that a picture of, you know, it's Northern Spotted Owl soup, right? It was a really complicated thing, but you know, old growth was protected and thus, I think, had it not been for the barred owl, they probably would continue to, to do all right. Um, you know, knock on wood. Yasha, did you have? Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta give me a hard question, didn't you? Um, so um, there are two approaches you can take, um, and I think um, depending on what the target is, I would take either one. So one, um, if you're thinking about um, particular ecosystems, right? I keep on joke, you know, saying try, try and uh, 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 creek. There's a watershed, right? So let's suppose um, we thought that was endangered. What would that mean? Because it's not like the number of organisms is declining like a species. Um, uh, the, the thought would be um, that either the tree species, the cycling, the basic processes were starting to stall out in that particular place. Um, you know, there are certain functional roles that things do there, but that's a particular one. And so you would count it in, the, in a very similar way to the way you would count uh, extinction or endangerment with species. Um, you know, uh, it, it would be like one of us being unhealthy, right? Um, in the sense that, um, you know, our demise is near. But now if we're thinking about biomes, we're thinking about kinds of ecosystems, that's a very different thing. And there I'm thinking about the frequencies of those ecosystems throughout the world. So you might say we should protect old growth because we value, it, value that kind of ecosystem and we don't want it to go to zero, right? Um, and that's a very different way of counting them. Does that make sense? The first, the first one is more controversial because I'm thinking of, of ecosystems in the, in the language of philosophy of biology as kind of individual-like. They're particular things and they have, they have a beginning and an end and they can get smaller and larger. Um, and I think ecosystems are very much like that. I don't think they evolve, but I do think that they have a history and they're, they're a, a, a thing that persists through time. Um, they could, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you know, I said there's sort of two ways to identify biomes. The first was indexically. So you go, and this is old growth dug fir. Now you don't have that ecosystem if you don't have dug fir, right? Because I've just defined it that way. But if you follow Whitaker and you capture what an ecosystem is in this much more sort of um, dimensional way, um, so long as, you know, it fits a certain profile in terms of precip precipitation, temperature, and what other variables, who's there matters very little. Um, so long as it is an ecosystem of that type. And so that allows for rapid change and so on. Um, I should say that that's more of what I have in mind because the wildlife biologist in Washington who emailed me um, saying like, look, you should be worried about forests. And he didn't mean a particular forest. I mean, he meant forests of this kind. And so um, that's sort of what I have in mind. So if the northern spotted owl disappears, right, um, it's, we don't know yet what the barred owl's functional role will be like. Will it do many of the same things that the spotted owl does? Um, we have you know, lots of information about food webs and so on, but we just don't know. So it might turn out that the barred owl um, settles in and you know, kind of takes up the same role that the northern spotted owl once had, with the exception of um, you know, being essentially linked to old growth.
lots more to be said about all this, but yeah. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. I'm just wondering if you see any connections between this work you're doing here on ecosystems and your work on the emotions and metaethics. Um, yeah. You talk about being worried about ecosystems um, and like talk about the val like the values we have about ecosystems. Yeah, that's the question. So that's a great question. Um, I have like lots of dual lives, right? Um, and that, it's interesting to ask how they cross. So another part of my philosophical kind of work is on the nature of emotions, how they evolved and how they're expressed. Um, and so um, Theo's asking kind of like, how do these two things go together? Well, one of the things that like deeply informs my way of thinking about these ethical issues, so I said that um, um, on the one side, you know, I'm, I'm leaning more towards a deontologist now than I was before. Um, and that also I'm sort of, um, I'm much more of a sentimentalist now. And so I think part of when you know, Joel asked me, why do you think you know, we should do what and what? I have to ask sort of questions about my moral emotions, right? Um, would I feel guilt? Would I feel shame? You know, would I feel pride, et cetera? Um, and I think those are really deeply linked to moral judgment. Um, and so I think the framework I've been talking about is not for any one person to kind of work out. It's rather for us to do collectively, democratically, and being very honest about the ways in which we think and feel. Um, and so that has really helped me think about the normative nature of doing this kind of work. Um, the other kind of cross-pollination is my thinking about the nature of emotions is very much like how I think about ecosystems. They're, they'd sort of, um, uh, earlier I had a picture, one of the people in that picture was Richard Boyd, who was a philosopher here for a while from Cornell, and he had a certain view about the nature of kinds, and that was a kind of homeostatic property cluster. Things hang together in a certain kind of interactive way, and so I find both of those appealing in both the ecosystem stuff, but also in the emotion. Yeah. Probably have time for maybe one more question, if anyone a burning desire for one more. Right that down here. Oh, right here in the front. Hi, Jay. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm just curious how your uh, how evolution folds into these arguments for you. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, um, I had a really strange experience once of, um, I went to a, a conference, a workshop rather, up in um, upper New York State at Colby College, I think. Um, and um, it was a group of philosophers, like myself, philosophers of science, environmental philosophers, and the other group were paleontologists. And the task for us was, like, if we're going to conserve stuff, what should we conserve? And, you know, the the paleontologists were all into bivalves and, you know, things like that and so on. And we, you know, we were worried about spotted owls and, you know, this sort of thing. And they said, you're thinking about the wrong thing. Look at the tree of life and grab as much diversity as you can. Grab the opposite limbs because you, if you want to restart the engine of life again, you know, mass extinctions happen all the time. Well, not all the time, but they happen. Um, if you want to restart, you want a, you want a, a diverse portfolio to begin from, right? And that always struck me as a powerful. So even beneath all of this, when I think about diversity, um, I'm thinking about you want to preserve diverse ecosystems. You want diver I mean, that's the, the, the entire import, I think, of biodiversity, right? Um, so evolution is not directly appearing, but it's always lurking in the back as a way of thinking about, you know, Life is precious, it's fragile. If we want life on this planet, um, we don't only protect mammals, don't only protect birds, but you know, get, get all of it, yeah. Okay, well, thank you all very much, and thank uh, Jay, another round of applause. So uh, you heard Jay earlier say, uh, after a glass of beer or wine, uh, there's some movement in his philosophical thinking. So uh, um, please join us uh, right outside here in the Beth Miller Lounge. We're going to have a reception, um, food, drink, um, and conversation. So thank you for coming, and, and please join us um, out front.